Our next, next speaker today is Andrew Smith. Andrew is a fruit grower from Tamanick, which is just down near the Warby Ranges in northeast Victoria. Smiths of Tamanick grow and supply quality summer fruits to farmers markets throughout Victoria. Andrew has been actively involved in the family business for 20 years. His roles include production, packing, food safety and marketing. Andrew will focus on mineral and biological soil health and explain how this family business uses eco-farming principles. Andrew. Well, good morning and welcome people. And uh, I must say thanks for the opportunity of uh, speaking this morning. Okay, so biological farming, a grower's perspective. We often come to seminars and uh, hear professors speak and then we go away and say, well, can we put it into practice? Well, yes, there are things you can do and uh, hopefully I'll go through and we'll see, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the technical side and also uh, the things which a conventional system, how it falls over and how a balanced system uh, can hopefully uh, be sustainable and also cost effectively. So obviously with the grower profile, we've been over that. Um, we're also growing in uh, Tasmania now, which has uh, been a transition in our business down at Dover with cherries. And uh, that business also supplies supermarkets and wholesale markets. So uh, our, our business has uh, spread in the last uh, 12 or 18 months. So when we talk about the starting point, uh, starting point for us was at Wangaratta when you see these big holes here in the ground which have got no water in. So when you have uh, 40 or 45 hectares of uh, stone fruit, which is up on top of a plateau which doesn't have an irrigation system, which is down the back here, which is also dry, uh, we knew we had to try and change the way that we farmed. We had to uh, lift our carbon levels in the soil and we also needed to get the soil and nutrient cycling and hopefully try and retain some moisture, which obviously wasn't in our dams. So that was uh, the challenge where it started probably, let's say five to six years ago for us. So what, what drives our biological farming practices? Well, we wanted happy trees. Okay, so you can see the trees there. We can see one of our cherry pickers there. We wanted happy workers which could uh, come in and harvest a good crop. And also uh, we want to see ha happy customers and uh, with return sales with our product. And obviously quality drives sales. Without quality you don't have return sales and you don't have a sustainable business. So that was uh, a, a very big objective for us to maintain and develop. So I'll just talk uh, quickly about conventional farming methods uh, which are still used today. Uh, we've heard about uh, you know, MPK and fertil fertilisers, chemical fertilisers, pesticides, uh, fungicides and herbicides, which are typically used in a conventional system. So what com compromises a sustainable balanced system is uh, for every action you've got to think of what consequence each individual application will have. So if we're going to use those things that I just spoke about typically in a uh, non-balanced system, what, what act reaction is the uh, soil going to have? So when we use the MPK and chemical fertilisers, the insecticides and fungicides, uh, when we use the herbicides, what, what uh, results are they going to have on our soil? So we look at man's battle to try and control nature when we use these uh, variables. Uh, the plants need to be fed, so therefore the MPK fertilisers are applied. Uh, the natural balance tends to slip. Uh, the natural defence mechanisms become weakened. Uh, the weeds, insects and diseases, they tend to appear. Money is spent on herbicides and pesticides and fungicides to try and correct these problems. So initially the pests are killed along with the microbial population that could have provided the defence mechanism uh, to combat the uh, disease. So without the microbes, the applied fertiliser becomes increasingly unavailable. And I must say, if we're going to go out there and spend dollars on fertiliser, it's got to become plant available. We can't just have it sitting out there or, or leaching away. It's got to be uptake into the plant. So the plant health uh, suffers. Uh, the pests 
adapt to the poisons. Quite often you hear resistance building up and we've got to have this new whiz-bang, new butte chemical to knock it over and it costs a fortune. So the solution appears obvious. We'll spend more on high nitrate fertilisers and uh, the latest weed, insect and disease fighting chemicals. So the soil goes further out of balance while uh, natural feeding and defence mechanisms continue to weaken. Uh, maintenance costs rise while plant health does not improve. So it's fairly, fairly typical unless you're really on top of a um, traditional system. You know, you can have these problems, they can crop up overnight. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the photosynthesis cycle and the uh, way it all uh, sort of fits. It's pretty important that our plants do cycle uh, because what we've got here is obviously a tree or a, a plant or whatever it may be, but the big picture is it's like a big sugar factory and we need this cycle to be uh, working because uh, when we get into the soils, the plant actually releases 30% of it of its sugar production daily into the roots. And of course when we see our, uh, our rootlet here we've got uh, the activity taking place around uh, the root tip which is uh, sequestering our nutrients for the tree or plant. Okay, so the sugar arrives as an exudate which the roots give off in the rhizosphere for microbial food. Okay, so we've talked about our aspects, principles. Uh, it's probably a bit of a similar s message because basically the message is the same. It doesn't change from what we've got physical, chemical, and nutrient, and microbiological is the three, three aspects of the soil. So when we s talk about physical, well, what is that? Well, it's our tilth, our aeration, moisture retention, our exchange capacity, and the ability for the soil to buffer. With uh, our chemical, it's obviously our uh, mineralization, what's actually available in those nutrients within the soil. And then with our microbiological side of it, we've got our, our fungi, our bacteria, protozoa and nematodes, which are all in actively in the soil. So that's the, the three key, key areas which uh, work, work all together. So we talk about extraction versus absorption within our uh, root system. In the extraction process, the root chemically requests the nutrients it needs from the microbes surrounding the root. So the, the plant actually sends out a message uh, to the microbes and they'll uh, bring back what the plant actually requires. It seems a bit over the top, but it, so they tell me, and I'm sure that's what the professor will probably say as well, but the, the microbes, uh, they're the gatherers, they bring back um, the nutrients. And in the absorption process, only those nutrients that come in direct contact with the root can enter through the root wall. And typically nitrogen is uh, one of the most easiest to take up through that direct absorption process. So we, carbon, carbon equals life. Well, um, carbon is the basic building block for all life in on into the earth. Carbon is a driver for every aspect of soil, health and soil function. It's the master key to every door. So as we can see, it's Pretty important and uh, it is hard to get in and it's hard to keep there, so you've got to keep working at it. We can't live without it, neither can our soils. So it's a critical component. So for every 1% gain in our organic carbon, humus, you increase your water capacity by uh, 140,000 litres per hectare. So humus will hold four times its weight in water. Okay, so biological farming systems, where to start? Okay, you've got to determine your goal, where you want to get to and how fast you want to get there. So you've got to start what you, with what you're comfortable with. You need to try a block or a little area somewhere on your farm uh, and you've got to get comfortable with uh, what you're doing. Okay, so there's no silver bullets, there's no single product or a step that works by itself. Okay, you must stick to your goal. Okay, don't deviate. You go and talk to the neighbours and they'll say, uh, look, it's uh, probably a bit of witchcraft you're trying to play it out here, so don't be influenced by the neighbours. Peer group pressure. You've got to stay strong and you must have a programmed approach. So like I said, you can't have one single bullet that's going to be the saviour for you. You've got to uh, 
come in and look at the whole process and uh, stick to your gu guns and it is it does take time you won't see a, you may see a result in the first year typically if you've got um, blocks that are pretty bad you will see a result quicker so beware of the snake oil seller because unfortunately they uh, come around knocking on the door proclaiming they've got a single product that's going to cure all so use someone who can give you a total programmed approach. Okay, you need to get a coach or a mentor and attend workshops like these today and hear speakers. But I must say one of the biggest uh, learning curves you can have is you know, network at the breaks, talk to like-minded people. If there's grower days when, like when there's field, field trips, get out there and actually kick the dirt and uh, see it with people that are actually doing it. So, managing plant health using nature's principles. Okay, plants are fed with a balanced program for nutrients, solid and liquid humus based blends and microbial inoculants. Okay, the growing environment then moves towards balance. The natural defence mechanisms become stronger. Weeds, insects and disease pressures ease. Money spent on the sides club, which is our uh, herbicide, fungicide, insecticides, uh, declines. So that's not going to help the chemical resellers, unfortunately, but that's, that's the way it needs to be. So the microbial population that defends against the disease increases and supports the growing system. Okay, so the natural microbial defence mechanisms are able to react when challenged by pest and disease. We need, we need them because they're out there, they're a front line. They're in the trenches working for us every day. So if there is a reaction in the soil or a pest or a disease that comes along, we need them on side. So the solution is not spending more on fertilisers and chemicals, but it's to leverage nature's principles. Okay, so the soil reacts, the balance in the natural feeding and defence mechanisms continue to strengthen. Key elements for the microbes are definitely uh, air, food, water and comfort. They're no different to any other creature that walks above the ground, they're operating underneath the ground, we can't see them but they are there. So they need the creature compass just as well as your stock and so forth do. Maintenance costs it will decline and uh, the plant health will improve. So the benefits of a balanced biological system. Nutrients cycle in accord as our soils become more balanced. We reduce pest and disease pressure. Input costs stabilise and reduce after time. Higher sustainable production is achieved and maintained. Higher bricks levels in plants and fruit. We have better quality product with a longer shelf life for consumers to enjoy. That's something that we've definitely seen over time. Our uh, consumers often come back to to us and say we can't believe how long the fruit lasts. You know, it's just got better shelf life than what we can get in the supermarkets. So a program approach we currently use with our fruit, we'll typically do a post-harvest soil test and see what's going on in the block. Uh, we'll do a post-harvest foliar and fertigation program as we need to adjust. We'll do a prescription compost and mineral blends keep our uh, mineralisation going in the soil if there's something lacking. We we'll use compost teas if required. Seed treated cover crops, we'll uh, sow cover crops in the inter-row to try and help with our um, digestion, help aerate the soil and also if we can seed treat our cover crops we can hopefully introduce different microbial populations that we need to expand into the soil. Soil aeration, we can run the aerator over the block and hopefully uh, do that, but we haven't done that as much lately. I'd rather go the cover crop way. And uh, we'll do pre-harvest foliar and fertigation programs uh, to uh, grow the crop for the season. So some fertiliser solutions. We currently use humidified compost mixed with mineral blend to suit our blocks after we've done our soil tests. So you see the picture of the turner there with uh, the compost we've added some uh, I think that's cow lime we've added there to try and lift a bit of calcium in the block as well so we'll put it in with our carbon source 
hopefully it becomes uh, available a lot quicker. So when adding blends to the compost, um, typically, like I said, you can do your soil test and you're, you're tailoring a, a nutrient program with uh, putting in the compost as well. So we've got uh, another blend on the on my left, with some more kel, I think, and uh, you can see it after after it's turned once uh, it's worked in through the compost. So uh, the humidified compost manufacturer and its benefits, this has been a big part of the change and the shift in the way we uh, operate at home. And I'll just run you quickly through how we go about uh, building our compost. So typically we start with our major carbon source, which is the uh, straw, which we can get fairly readily from our uh, cereal growers around locally to home. So we'll bring the bales in, we'll line them up, and uh, put the turner over them. Then we can put in some grape mark, which has come off from some of the vignerons from not so far away as well. And we've got some uh, nitrogen sources with uh, pig, chicken, and cow manures. We try and put in th at least two to three manures to try and give us some diversity of um, microbes. So once all the feedstocks have uh, been in, we've blended up the row, we've got it all mixed in. Then we'll add a little bit of clay, which helps with the crumb structure of the uh, compost and uh, also can help with a bit of the odour control and uh, the moisture level within the compost as it goes through its process. So once the composting begins, we can see the heat phase starting. We've got to turn the compost uh, according to the uh, temperatures because we don't want it to get uh, above 60 degrees. So you can see the steam coming out the back, which has created the heat from the microbial generation and the breakdown of the um, feedstock. It's just another uh, picture of the compost. As it gets a bit further along, we've got some covers on the compost to try and keep it a bit more stable and keep the water out if it does happen to rain. So after a 10 or 12 week process, we end up with our finished compost, which is uh, quite amazing. You can see the transition as it grows through the cycle and to think that it ends up virtually looking like soil is uh, quite unique. Okay, compost teas. Um, we've done a little bit with compost teas. Uh, we've made uh, our own brewer there at one stage. Another uh, neighbour which lives close by. So like-minded and we got together and made a couple. They've been pretty successful. Got an air blower pump. It shows a couple of pictures of the brewer working there. So compost added to the soil establishes a healthy environment which microbes can thrive. Increases the amount of variety of microorganisms. Okay, balances the soil chemically as well as biologically. Increases base saturation balance. Enhances nutrient availability improves the physical structure of the soil and it aggregates the soil, allowing air as well as water to flow through the soil. So we've got our three aspects of the soil which we talk about there and hopefully that's uh, covered. So the value of the humidified compost and the mineral, mineral blends, the true value of the humidified compost and blends come from the ability to restore and enhance the nutrient and biological activity in the soil. So we really want to turn that soil on and get it uh, sustainable. So when we're using uh, insecticides and fungicides, there's some solutions that we can use if we do have to go out and use these. So uh, they don't, we don't take a step back with our uh, microbe population, which is out and about, whether it's on the tree or in the ground. So typically we'll um, add uh, fish kelps and fulvic acids, which uh, are a food source and they also rebuild the population. So the fulvic acid acts as a buffer and the chemicals. So some sustainable herbicide solutions. <coughs> Reduce the weed strip to a minimum so uh, we don't want to see bare land because our carbon will uh, get off. We want to reduce the chemical rates by at least 20 to 25 per cent with our herbicides and I think we've actually gone to 30 now. So. We, what we've been doing is we add uh, citric acid to the water to try and lower the pH. We'll add sugar or molasses as a food source into the water for the biology. We also add uh, fulvic acid to help with the uptake of the herbicide uh, in the plant and buffer the chemical effects on the soil. 
So products used in the balanced biological system, uh, we've gone fairly heavily on straw on planting young trees, try and keep the weeds down and also help with our moisture. So we use our humidified compost with mineral blend, compost teas and compost extracts, under tree mulches to cover bare land. When planting trees and seeds, inoculate the roots. Pretty important when we plant a new uh, block that we want to inoculate the roots straight away so we can get some more of that biology straight in around the root. Seed treated cover crops, hydrolyzed fish and kelps. We've uh, used a lot of them over the last four or five years. Whenever we spray, we generally put something like that in the tank. Humic and fulvic acids become a pretty big part too. Uh, sugars and molasses is that food source. If we want to go out there, we want to try and help uh, support the system and soil aeration. Some tools used in our system, we've got a refractometer which will uh, measure the uh, bricks levels in our sap or, or the uh, bricks level in the fruit as well. Penetrometer so you can see what your soil's doing with the aeration. Uh, and pH meter for when we're uh, brewing compost teas or and uh, lowering the pH in the water of the herbicides. So a biological farm system increases soil balance and fertility increases root system capability and capacity, produces healthier, better tasting foods, gives consumers an enjoyable experience, gives growers greater sales and better returns. Okay, so that's what we want to see. We want to see happy growers with some dollars in the bank, hopefully. So it's got to be sustainable business-wise as well. Uh, just quickly here, we've got a leaf comparison test, which was done out of uh, the same block. So if we look up here on the uh, left, We'll see how it was uh, a bit all over the place. That was in 90, it was 07. Okay, so things were a little bit all over the place. And we come back here 12 months later after uh, our application of compost, we've seen that things have come back a bit more in balance to show that the system's cycling a bit better. We haven't got things all over the place. So the benefits we have seen to date at home, we've seen less pest and disease pressure, and it's been considerable. We've definitely had a shift in uh, pesticide use. Um, better soil structure, definitely better soil structure. We see uh, a lot of worms, earthworms operating. Uh, the soil and leaf tests are becoming more imbalanced as we uh, go along the track. It definitely does take time. Increased soil bio biological activity is uh, increased. We're seeing the higher bricks readings in both leaf and fruit and longer shelf life of our fresh fruits. Can I use this system at home? That's the question you've got to ask yourself out there today. Well, of course you can. You've got to set your goal though. Okay, and be strong. Get a coach or a mentor. Research the subject. Okay, be comfortable with where you start. That's the main thing. You have to be comfortable. Use a programmed approach. Be patient, it takes time to see the results. Okay, stick to your plan, don't deviate, and reevaluate your program annually. Here's a picture of uh, my grandfather. He was probably unbeknownst to him at the time. He was definitely an early bio farmer. Here we have tick beans planted in the orchard, which we're no doubt getting some nitrogen fixation from, and as well, we've got our carbon source when he plowed it back in. and. Uh, Little did he know probably back then how beneficial it was. So that's just some finished compost. And thanks for today. Thank you.